Good evening. Welcome to Firebase. So glad you tuned in this evening. We have a special guest with us, and I've just got to call him Brother John Graves. John is the CEO of Million Voices, uh, and listening to his story about how God has brought him along, not only as an ordained uh, pastor, but as an attorney. Uh, I know that sounds contradictory when you say a pastor and an attorney, but you'll find very quickly this works together well. And the, the emphasis uh, and the push of Million Voice is absolutely amazing. I, I went to their website and read from their website some of the 10 guiding truths that are there. And we'll get into that as part of the show here this evening. But right now, folks, I want to introduce you to uh, Brother John Graves. John, welcome to the show tonight. Delighted to be with you. Thanks for having me. There is no lacking of news. Well, there's things we can talk about and go in any direction. But I want us to start this evening asking you to tell us, tell our audience a little bit about Million Voices and what that is and how God's using you in that ministry, that outreach. Yeah, I'd be delighted to. Really, Million Voices, if I could sum it up, is a effort to let people's voice be amplified. We wanna be a megaphone for a lot of people. The number one reason people don't get involved, they don't vote, they've, they've kind of given up on the political process or the government process is because they think their voice doesn't matter. But, it, but our whole concept in prayer was, what if there was a million people just like you all getting behind a million voices for life, a million voices for religious freedom, those kind of things. And all of a sudden, it's not just one of us, but there's a lot of us out there if we will all speak in, in unison. So that's kind of what started it. We're an association of churches. We have thousands of pastors, all denominations, all races, uh, small churches, online churches, mega churches uh, that we come along and we serve them for political discipleship and cultural Amen. apologetics, which is the greatest need, I think, in our culture. You know, I, I'm glad you make mention that. I, I took the time uh, to not only go to your website and read over, I, I registered uh, personally <laughs> onto your website. And I, here's what I read, uh, and, I, and, I, and I've just got to read this. This sort of jumps out at the start. Every day, thousands of people are flooding across the U.S. southern border. Up to 68% of migrant women and children are sexually assaulted during their harrowing journey to the U.S. border. Criminal forces recruit those seeking refuge, and it's, it's a powerful statement. But one thing that jumped out at me, John, was that uh, what people can do, you said, more than just contacting a legislator, a legislator, you indicate this here is we're asking you to pray and give to mobilize mm -hmm. other people to get involved. And I highlighted this. You talk about making political discipleship and cultural mm -hmm. apologetics, that's the heart of the education. What do you mean by political discipleship? Well, I think a lot of people, from pastors all the way to Christ followers of all kinds, they don't understand that we get to elect who governs us, or they see it as just, oh, they're all fake, and they're all there for their own purpose, which there's a lot of truth to that. And political discipleship, we do discipleship in every realm. Matter of fact, I'm going through a celebration of discipline with my older two kids right now on the spiritual disciplines. And yeah. what we've lost in our culture is we have kind of a celebrity Christianity or a spectator Christianity where people just get information from somebody who's a really gifted worship leader or teacher. Yeah. Yeah. But they've, we've lost discipleship. And discipleship is not just the spiritual disciplines, but how we influence the culture around us, not just for evangelism Amen. to save them, but to transform the culture for the good of all people, even those who don't yet believe in God. And yeah. so we, we break it down that way. So I, the reason I use both terms is because political discipleship, there's a lot of people who are trying to do something, want to do something. Maybe they're praying, maybe they're voting, maybe they're giving towards some cause. Cultural apologetics is people who have been deceived by the masses and this is a massive academic, ep epidemic. It's, yeah, it's literally, yeah. whether it's Black Lives Matter, oh, that sounds good on the surface, until you start peeling away and, and investigating like the Bereans, uh, wait a minute, this is a Marxist indoctrination process here. Of course, all lives matter, Black Lives Matter, Amen. but the Black unlive uh, matter just as much as anyone else. And so uh, part of the problem and what Satan uses is to discourage people and part of the misconception in the church is the church is kind of divided on a lot of these issues, and they weight the different moral issues instead of embracing all of them. 
Doesn't it seem there? It, it does to me. But doesn't it seem like we've surrendered the the God given values and the that wonderful divine call? I I hear a lot of people in ministry today say they look at what they're doing in church work and they say it's a job. That's my job. But when did we stop? When did we shift from it being a divine call of God? Yeah, that's a good point. I I, I talked yesterday to a pastor, a uh, close friend of mine, who for years was an executive pastor, one of the largest well-known churches in the country. And we've been talking since last year. I asked him again yesterday. I said, is, is during the COVID epidemic, he said, I've never seen so many pastors just quitting the ministry, just right. giving up. Right. They don't know what to say. If they say something about BLM, they get in trouble. If they don't say something, they get in trouble. If they try to say something, they get in trouble. And they don't know how to, how to do cultural apologetics on these controversial, complicated issues. And a lot of them are just giving up, going into some other vocational. And you're right. exactly right. If it's a calling, you can't walk away from it. Um, if you can do something else, go do it. But if, if it's God's call, you really can't do it. And I asked him yesterday, I said, are they still... Is it still that bad? He said, John, I've never seen it this bad in 40 years. Uh, there's yeah. just so many of them. They came into a church and some of it now is a lot of the churches are just letting off a lot of their staff and becoming, you know, digital online. Nothing wrong with that. That is a huge critical part. And it's an opportunity right now to spread the gospel, to spread education and discipleship and apologetics. But we cannot ignore relationships, accountability, Amen. small groups where, where life happens, where people know who you are Amen. and can do life with you, even if you also have an online community. Well, the laying off of staff that you make mention of, I, the, what, the image that popped into my brain immediately, my, my wife talks about things. I'm like a, a domino. One thing leads to another. Uh, but it's sort of like the, the checkout counter where you self-checkout at the yeah. store now. You, so you want your religion, just Great make sure point. that the labels turn the right way and you scan it, boop, and That's you good. get on through and got your got your fix for the day. You know, I, I yeah. love it. Mario Murillo's it's common. He says, the day, I wish I could do his voice, the day of skinny jeans and smoke machines are over. <laughs> and and I, I love that. I think that's absolutely yeah. right. I, I, yeah. I've got a book that I picked up this week. And it's, and it's called The Faith Road, written by a pseudonym by the name of Elliot Branch. And let me just share one, one little spot in here and just get your reaction to it. And there's two sentences. If we are not a threat to Satan, he won't bother us. And then mm -hmm. he says, the only way to live a comfortable Christian life, safe from persecution, is to never be a threat to Satan. we got about mm -hmm. three minutes for our first break. What's your reaction to yeah. that? Yeah, to me, I think that is so true, and and it's the opposite of what most people do. A lot of people think that we're defensive. We stay, and you, you know this scripture. Uh, you've been preaching God's Word for 30-something years. The gates of hell will not prevail against Amen. our kingdom, against Christ. We're the ones who are supposed to be on the offensive, and too many times people are silenced, which is where we came up with million voices. We want you we, we thought about salt and light because that's what Christ says. We're, we're the ones that are the light. Yes, it's dark. It's supposed to be dark. We live in a fallen world, but we're the light of the world because he is inside of us. We also Amen. have a voice. We also have the ability to speak. And a lot of times, if you stay silent on these things, people stayed silent when their liberty was taken away over COVID, when their liberty was taken away and, and uh, over the election integrity stuff. All of these issues, people stayed silent because they weren't sure what to say. What we're trying to do is begin the process to say, here's one of the things you can say, and here's the smartest person for you to say it to, which is your state rep, your state senator, because you have the best chance to actually influence them to do something. And so we can unpack that after the break. Uh, but to me, Amen. you're exactly right. We have to be on the offensive. We don't have to be offensive, but we have to be assertive. When I was in college years before, and then I went into the military, then I went to seminary and got a master's and a PhD, and then... I, when I was going to a little community college, uh, they gave me a scholarship, academic scholarship, which I thought, who would have thunk it? I never thought I was that bright. <laughs> and I had a blind professor, Dr. Charles Melton. Mm -hmm. He always wore his glasses, and his glasses were always just slightly askew. And he, somebody would make a comment like you just made, and he would look at them through those blinded eyes with his glasses askew, and he would say, that will preach. And I think there has to come a time where not only the pastors, but the individual yes. uh, people in the pews say, that will preach, and I have to go preach that. Um, 
why do you think, and we've got 90 seconds, why do you think people are so timid? Uh, and we can carry this after the break, but why are the pastors so timid? I, I, I think a lot of the pastors are. I serve pastors. I've spoken in front of 7,000 pastors in the last several years. I love pastors. People get very frustrated because they're not speaking up, but a lot of times they don't know exactly what to say. These things are complicated issues that nobody's ever faced before. My heart goes out to pastors because they're overwhelmed with broken families, drug addictions, all the gender confusion, all the distractions. Um, I can get into Ezekiel 16, 49. You were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned yep. was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, according to the scripture. Not, not homosexuality where everybody goes to, but it's this, it's this, we're distracted. And that's where pastors are trying to just do the basics. And I think a lot of them are intimidated because they don't understand how simple this could really be. And so that's my heart is to kind of put the cookies on the lowest shelf, if you will, Amen. and say, listen, here's the most impactful thing you can do and make it very, very simple for them to be a voice that makes an influence. Amen. Boy, that will preach. And I think that's one of the things that we have to remember and that in ministry, we're not hirelings. We are called right. by God and it is a divine call. It's not a salary. It's not, we're making a living and hanging on till retirement. When we get back from the break, we're gonna talk about a few more issues and reference even some other Old Testament scriptures. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We're talking this evening with John Graves, CEO of Million Voices. And we were talking earlier about church being silent and pastors being silent. And he quoted a, a scripture out of Ezekiel. Brother John, that made me think of that wonderful scripture out of 1 Kings. When we hear the story of Elijah, chapter mm -hmm. 17 and 18, and he takes the stand. He's going against the adversary. He's going against Baal and the prophets of Baal, and Jezebel, and Ahab. And he makes this profound statement. He says that if Baal is Baal, serve him. If God is God, serve him. And to me, this is the most condemning statement in the entire Bible that could be said of God's people, New or Old Testament. And the people said not a word. Do you find that happening a lot across our yeah. land and in the churches today? I do. And that's exactly what we're trying to counter. The silence in the church, sometimes out of ignorance, sometimes out of fear, sometimes out of uh, a wrong motive. We're trying to turn that silence into voices of all Christ followers so that what they do is use their voice to get the truth out. And the, the way we do everything that we do, we try to do grace and truth. Jesus in the Gospel of John says it, he was full of grace and truth. And too many times, in the political world, pastors choose between the two. They, they take the truth and they're hard with it, but there's no grace. There's no compassion. There's no winsomeness. Yeah. And yeah. The, the response to that, unfortunately, especially with the younger pastors, is they're, they're going to sh shy away from the truth in the name of grace, but it ends up becoming cheap grace. It ends up becoming, you know, we want to be compassionate, which we do. But then there's a way to be full of truth while you're full of compassion and grace. And so that is part of our passion, which, which honestly, the 10 guiding truths you alluded to earlier is unique with us because a lot of people only talk about maybe life or, or, or maybe biblical marriage. Uh, now more people are talking about religious freedom, but they're not talking about the poor. They're not talking about us stewarding the environment. They're not talking about uh, justice, biblical justice. They're not civil rights. They're biblical justice issues. And those issues are all critical to the heart of God. And so we deal Amen. with them, although it, it, you know, offends Republicans and Democrats. But I believe if the church truly wakes up, if there's an ultimate spiritual awakening, it will disrupt both of those political parties. That's the system that we have to use. Uh, it's a flawed system, like every other system that's out there that's made by man. But it's the better system that's out there in the whole world. But when the church truly wakes up, we, we shouldn't let either one of them own any biblical issue. Hey Amen. I love that. I, I think one of the reasons that we see the church today so timid is that they've been taught to be timid. They think that the yeah. best way is, you know, I'm just going to love everybody. And I agree with that. We should love everybody because the Spirit Absolutely. of God lives within us. But if we're not going to love the body of believers first, how do we ever expect to love those outside the body. I, when I've had conversations with other pastors and they start to become critical of well-known 
pastors mm-hmm. or people that have a large yeah. venue, and they said they're not really preaching the whole counsel of the gospel. And I told, I tell them, I say, guys, I'm very cautious to make comment because that person is God's anointed for that place. And if that person is not preaching correctly, it's up to God right. uh, to That's take right. care of that, not me and not you. And uh, That's right. they, uh, your, your 10 guiding truths, I love these. I, I went to the website and, and, and just very quickly for the audience, it's freedom, life, justice, awakening, Israel, equality, need, family, dis- uh, stewardship, and creation. And, and in there you talk about political discipleship, but I want to point out just one aspect or whatever you want to go on this, but this jumped out at me, John. You put equality, and in my notes I put next to it, not equity, as That's the right. left asserts. What right. I know what you're talking about, but would you share uh, with our audience what you mean when you talk about equality? Yeah, equity of our equal outcomes is what the left often wants, what the Marxists want. They want everybody to be dumbed down to the same thing. And the scripture rejoices in our differences. He created his difference. God's nature himself is a triune God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they each have different attributes. They had different roles. They had different places in creating God's kingdom for mankind. And so take gender as, as an example. Male and female, he made them. So they're co-heirs with Christ, but they're not identical. There are differences that are good differences to be celebrated. And so what the left wants to do is create this confusion of, oh, well, that's oppressive. A woman didn't get to do this. And now they, the hypocrisy has turned it upside down where now men can compete in women's sports and rob women. It's doing the exact same damage that they claim that they're trying to deal with. Take the racial yeah. issues. Everybody yeah. wants to talk. There's only one race. God made one human race. The book of Acts says Preach one. it. Amen. That's blood, absolutely right. Out of one blood, he made one yeah. human race. Yes. Now, we have different nationalities. We have different ethnicities. We have different languages. We have different you know, skin tones and all those kind of things. And yet, that doesn't make it, oh, it's wrong if it's this. It's wrong if it's that. And, and what a lot of people uh, get confused about is the civil rights movement and both spiritual awakenings that led to freedom from tyranny from, from Amen. Great Britain Amen. and freedom for our brothers who were, who were in slavery. Those were spearheaded by the church. Those weren't Amen. spearheaded by the civil uh, powers that be or the power brokers. That was the church that was at the forefront of trying to fight for biblical truth in that issue. And that's what a lot of them want to to now deceive and and create other things like like your sexual choice i can be yeah. i can be born a man or born a woman and if i just choose to say it now you're a discriminator you're a racist if you misgender me well that's not at all what the those fights were about and so and and yet a lot of people like you said earlier they just stay out of the issue. They just avoid it because they don't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to talk about it or they get in trouble because it's not right. politically correct to talk right. about it. It's like, hey, uh, you take care of your character. God will take care of your reputation. I heard I was talking to a friend of mine recently who's a federal agent and he does you know, arrest people. And he says it's so ridiculous now that they can't use ma'am and sir uh, in their reports. They can't identify or profile as I arrested this white male or right. this suspect, and yep. and it's, it's just the lunacy never seems to cease when you think about that. And he even went on, and he said, you know what, if I can choose my gender, today I'm a female because it's it's half half off on the drinks at the bar I want to go to tonight. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's, you know, not that I would advocate that. One of the things that, uh, that just happened on August the 15th was Dr. Fauci, was talking about we need to put aside all of our concerns about liberties and personal liberties and realize that we've got a common enemy. And as a Christian, I know who the common enemy is, but he says we've got to just forget our personal liberties. And in Million Voices, you're, the, the first guiding truth is freedom. How important yes. is that? It's, it's huge. And, and, and religious freedom is what people are, are losing. I, I, I was in Israel. I have been going every single year to Israel with a, a key group of, of folks. And we were over there when COVID was shutting down. So it was the end of February, 1st of March last year. And by the time I get back, we were one of the last flights that got out of there because they were closing down before the U.S. Everybody's closing down. 
and my own governor, I live in Texas, decided that these people were essential, just unilaterally without legislative debate or anything. He just decided he was going to be the dictator. And these were essential and these were not. And I'll never forget it because I'm an ordained pastor. I serve pastors, but I'm also a business owner and I'm an attorney. And so because I was an attorney, I could still drive to work. And they were worried about the police officer stopping you. Nobody was supposed to be on the road. They were going to do this great kind of slow down the curve or whatever. And I was so offended. And I thought people are not going to stand for this. I'm essential because I'm a lawyer and not right. because a, pa a pastor is far more essential than an attorney is spiritually and in every other way. And so I called my staff and I said, today, all of you are working for the attorney, John Graves. Y'all come, y'all come to the office anyway, <laughs> but spiritually, we're going to do spiritual God. work. Um, Praise God. And I was so offended and so shocked, so shocked that everybody just laid down and gave up their freedoms. And if you'll and give up your said freedoms not a word. and they can tell you to wear a mask and what to wear, they can now, they're fighting to, to, to put an experimental drug that they haven't even approved yet. It's not legally even allowed to do. And now you lose your job for it. The military is forcing it. And if they're going to tell you what to wear, tell you what to put inside of yourself uh, that has just as many risk as the, as the alternative, uh, you're, not, you're, you're giving your freedoms away. So people have to do something. They have to stand up. But there's a cost to stand up. And that's what people don't want to do. Well, we're going to take a short break here, John. We'll be right back as we finish up our program tonight. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We're in the final portion of our show here this evening, and we have had a dynamite interview with uh, John Graves, CEO of Million Voices. John, we were talking a few minutes just before we uh, went to the break, and then over the break we were talking about, and I shared something with you that I, I read recently, and I really want you to uh, run in the direction you want to with this. And, and it says, in Hawaii, there's 1,200 first responders are suing the state over the imposed vaccine mandates. And I've, I've marched recently with the doctors and uh, nurses here in Kentucky because of their resistance uh, mm -hmm. to push back against the mandatory vaccines. And sort of like an old Star Trek movie with the enemy Borg coming in, resistance is futile, but they're pushing back. What can we do? You know, to me, uh, it doesn't matter if resistance is futile. We're not, we're not told to fight or, or, or go after the kingdom of darkness or the gates of hell only if we think we're going to win, only when we do win. We're told Amen. to do the right thing and let Amen. the results be uh, up to God. So I, I love that you're doing that. I love that people, there has to be a courage that has to rise up. Yes, it's hard. Yes, you have a risk. Yes, I mean, any calling, I think I'm, I'm living this. You have to give up something else, but God well, true. promises it may not look like you think, but if the kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, then it can, it can yield much fruit. And so if you resist, if you stand back, it may draw some attention to this kind of stuff because Amen. Uh, the quote you just read is, is troubling that don't care about your Liberty. We have a common enemy. Well, yes, we do have a common enemy. The common enemy is Satan, not a flu. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not minimizing the dangerousness of this flu and be prudent and take you know care uh, to build up your immune system or to address it properly. Uh, but this flu is being used to create government control and rip away people's freedoms, their religious freedoms. And we need to discern like the Bereans, discern what that is and know what to do. And part of what we need to do is stand against these kind of things. So I Amen. applaud the people you're helping. I think your point about uh, we don't engage in this battle or this struggle because we're not going to win. We're quick to quote, I read the end of the book. I know we win. Mm -hmm. But we sometimes think that our God is a puny God. How can we stir mm -hmm. the hearts of people to say, you know what? God is God. He's not Baal. That's right. And one of my passions, we have this at millionvoices.org where we set out. So we just started with the border. We're going to do the vaccine. We're going to do critical race theory. We're going to do crime. Uh, all, all of our 10 guiding truths, we're going to cover every one of those. And, and what we have learned is at the federal level, you can make very little difference, if, even if a lot of people do it, because it's so controlled nationally. So you look at almost every piece of legislation, rare exceptions happen. Uh, they're almost all completely Republican, completely Democrat, and there's very, very few people who change. You look at the state level, and if you try to influence your state, those people at a state rep level or a state senator level, 
they're very much still able to be influenced by people who are voters in their community, pastors. What I tell pastors to say is go visit them and say, hello, I'm pastor of 100 people or 1,000 right. people, whatever it right. is. We want to know how we can pray for you. And we want to know how you're standing on this because my responsibility is to lead my people and we're very engaged in this process. Well, even if that state rep or state senator doesn't like your politics or your morals, he knows how to count. And a lot of Amen. those on average is 3,000 state uh, reps across the country. A lot of them are elected with a few thousand votes, 5,000 votes, 10,000 votes. And so that's where we tell people you can make the biggest difference is at the local level. School board is now a huge issue at the critical yeah. race theory, but people are disengaged. And I tell people, they say, oh, well, it's terrible. Only 5% vote in the primary and school board sometimes is 2% election. I'm like, that's good news. That means it takes less of us to make a bigger difference. And Amen. so uh, you can influence those. And now's the time. If there's ever been a time to go engage in it, not run from it Amen. and not withdraw Amen. from it and not get your holy little huddle over here. You can stay in a holy huddle if you want to, but make sure you're departing from that to go influence the culture. Amen. Amen. Folks, we've been having a wonderful conversation with John Graves of Million Voices. I encourage you to look up their website, find out more information and do your utmost to support Christian causes and Christian television. We look forward to seeing you again next week here on Firebase.